I want to talk to you about a fatherless generation. It's going to be different than what you're used to, but I want to talk to you really about not only the role of an earthly father, but the role of a spiritual father. I want to talk to you about honor and why we honor. And I want to talk to you about how the history of Christianity came to be. You know, God wasn't always viewed as a father. For years, he was righteous judge. He was overseer, he was provider, he was shepherd, he was healer, he was a number of things. But it wasn't until the book of Malachi when a new attribute of God would be introduced when the prophet Elijah would come and he would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of the children back to the fathers. I wanna begin my message with a video today that just moved my spirit. It's from one of our staff members, Carlos Sarti, who's become such a brother to me and love his family dearly. But this is his father who is a wonderful missionary in Guatemala. They have a, I believe a 30 year ministry in Guatemala. We're in covenant with him now, but because of COVID-19, uh, he didn't get to see his grandbaby till nearly two years of age. And uh, Carlos' sister filmed uh, the first time he got to see his grandbaby. And it reminded me of how our heavenly father looks at us as his children. So I want you to take a moment and watch this and be blessed by it. Then we'll get into the reading of God's word. This is my dad on his way to meet his granddaughter for the first time, who just turned two in May. And he had not been able to meet her before due to COVID. He was not able to travel to the US because he had not renewed his visa. And this is the first time she had traveled here to Guatemala. I wanted to share a little bit of the happiness that this video gave me. Being able to see my dad hug his granddaughter for the first time and how happy she was even though she had never met him before in person. And the big hug that she gave him when she saw him. Yeah, I can give God some praise for that. I think that's just a wonderful picture of who God is and who God has called us to be. Please stand on your feet in reverence for God's word today. Malachi chapter four, beginning with verse six. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Yes. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I said, in the Old Testament, we know God as almighty, most high provider, shepherd, protector, healer, the one who's there, the one who sees to it. You know all the names of God, I'm sure. We know him as creator, El Elohim. But it wasn't until Malachi where we really get introduced to the concept of God as a loving father. Yes, there are some mentions of father earlier. In Exodus, we know that in the law, we're to honor our father and mother, that our days may be long, upon the land which the Lord God is giving to us or our ancestors. We know that we should honor our parents. We know according to the Old Testament, we should obey our parents. But we really don't get to see this glimpse of who God is until the New Testament when we hear the things about God that he gives good and perfect gifts to his children. Jesus tells the story of a prodigal son who runs away from home and in that culture, this prodigal should have been pushed away, hated, should have had to pay back what he had taken from the inheritance for shaming the family. But we see a different kind of God now. We see a God that doesn't hate the son, doesn't make him pay anything back, that runs off a porch, hugs this prodigal, and doesn't just allow him to work in the slave quarters, puts a ring on his finger that represents wealth, robe on his back that represents honor, shoes on his feet that ranks him above a slave, kills a fatted calf, hires the most expensive band, and endorses a party for this wayward, sinning son. And we start learning in the new covenant about a loving father 
that is God. But Malachi says that the prophet has to come first and pave the way for this. There are two things going on. First, you have John the Baptist that paves the way for the Messiah. He says, one that's coming after me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with fire. And John the Baptist is baptizing Jewish believers in a baptism of repentance, making a way for the Messiah that would come and connect us to a loving father. Then in Revelation chapter 11, there are two witnesses and they will preach. And if you heard my series on that, you know I believe one of those in accordance with scripture is indeed Elijah in accordance with Jewish history. And he makes his way because he's the one that can call down things from heaven, rain and fire. And he preaches and people come to Christ, Jewish people, because of Elijah. So the book of Malachi does a number of things. The first thing is it looks back at the law. Everybody say the law. Although it's pointing to a period of silence of hundreds of years, it says we're not to forsake the law of God. We're not to make a mockery out of what was to get to what is. We've got to look back at the law. But then it says we're to look forward to the victory. A Messiah's coming, can I get an amen? One born of a virgin, one that will save humanity, one that will connect us to God the Father as a loving father, not a mean-spirited, religious, judgmental, I want you to die and live in hell for the rest of your life kind of God. A loving father. So John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah but we know Elijah is making his way towards the end times in the day of the Lord. Malachi is about to introduce a rebellious people who many years earlier through Abraham had been promised a wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. The temple's been rebuilt, but they are now making a mockery of the temple of God. They've now again turned their back on the things of God. Just like many of us in Christendom, we, we start off well and then we start doing what's right in our own eyes and then we, we, we hurt God's heart and then we repent and then we're back. And it is a journey, it is a fight, it is a struggle, but they had done this time and time again. They had perverted the promise of God. Perverted the promise of God. And God was about to go silent. But before, in the midst of this judgment, the messenger, that's what the word Malachi means, this messenger, this prophetic messenger says, listen, you're gonna be judged and there are gonna be consequences. However, I'm sending a prophet to you that's gonna show you the authentic love of God, that's gonna to lead to a savior that will save humanity, that will save mankind. So yes, Malachi looks back at the law, but it also looks forward to victory. But finally, it looks to others it looks backwards at the law, forward to the victory that's promised to us in the word, but it challenges us to look to others with the Father's love. Everybody say love. In chapter one of Malachi verse six, another reference to the Father is made. It says this, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? In other words, God is revealing himself as the father to a rebellious people. And, and he is saying, where is my honor? Where is my love? If I am a master, where is my reverence? Saith the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? So we should honor our fathers. And a father should be worthy of that honor. There was a survey done nearly 15 years ago that revealed that many men did not like Father's Day. Is anybody out there willing to admit that this morning? I mean, men, you know, they don't really like a lot of attention. They, 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 they want their kids to know they love them, that they want the honor, but men that are secure in who they are, we don't really need all that, do we? And, and many men are uncomfortable with the whole aspect of Father's Day, according to this 
particular survey. Even the ones who, who had children at home that were really doing it right, they said they felt guilty in this survey and were reminded of their past shortcomings or missed opportunities on Father's Day. So Father's Day can be a, a pretty difficult day for many people. Why? Well, some fathers have walked away. I was speaking with a former military person when we were in Tampa and they asked me a question. They knew I was a clergy and they said, Pastor, what do you think about all these school shootings? What do you think the reason is? I said, well, we have a father issue. You know, you can blame the media, you can blame the schools, you can blame the churches, but the fact is we have a father issue in this world. That's why we have gangs. That's why we have all of these ungodly clubs and cliques and lifestyles and genders to get involved with because people long for acceptance, affirmation, and identity. And if they can't get it from their own father or their heavenly father, they're gonna go after it somewhere in the world. And we've got to connect people with their purpose. We have a father issue. And some fathers feel guilty on this day because they walked away. Some are struggling today because their fathers have passed away. Some are dealing, some dads, with prodigals that ran away. And they're feeling guilty because their children are somewhere today they shouldn't be. They're away from the Lord, maybe addicted, maybe broke, maybe homeless, maybe in poverty, maybe in a lifestyle that they shouldn't be in. Some dads are managing the best they can to fill both roles. Some dads gave their rights away. I believe most all of us that are raising children or have raised kids deal with some guilt. I really believe that because I believe even Christian dads, and I would put the amount of hours I spent with my boys from two to 10 up against anybody. But there's still opportunities that could have been taken advantage of. There are still things that could have been said or done different. So I say today on this Father's Day, we put aside the guilt and call it a grace day, amen? I say we put aside all of that emotion and we focus on God's redeeming love. And we focus on I the Father as a God of love that gives us power to persevere, power to come back, power to make things right, power to press on. When all looks dark in the world in which we live, the good news of Jesus Christ is whether you've blown it or living it, trying to do it, have already done it, you're worthy because he's worthy. Because the blood makes you worthy. You're worthy because Jesus Christ came as fulfillment with Old Testament prophecy, fulfilled it, died for it, it's coming back for it, and we can be connected to the Father through Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Only God can be perfect through us. I'm amazed at some of you parents that's got little kids. You read Baby Wise and they're three years old, you know everything about parenting. Wait till they get teenagers. <laughs> then give me your lecture on how good of a parent you are. Because here's the reality. Every child is unique and created by God, but they're all different. Everybody warned me, all three of your kids are gonna be different. I lavished all this love and hugs on Trey and Trey doesn't love and hug. I wasted a million hugs on Trey. <laughs> and so then Reed come along, I thought, well, Trey didn't hug. Reed wanted to hug all the time as a little boy and love and all that. And they're all so different. I, it's hard to gauge what to say, what to do. Trey, the harder I kicked him, the better he did. Reed, I kicked him, he said, forget you, I'm done. I mean, they're just different. And Rice, I ain't allowed to do nothing to him because he's mama's baby, you know how that is. I just, I don't even mess with that, you know what I'm saying, he's the baby, so. But I'm telling you, they're all different, so we learn their strengths and their weaknesses and how to do and, and what to say, and, and, and we get it right, we get it wrong. But I tell you, the greatest thing we can do for our children is connect them with Abba Father. Maybe you didn't have a, a good relationship with your daddy or maybe it didn't work out. 
It's amazing to me how many successful people, and I don't care if you're talking academics, athletics, business, whatever profession, how many successful people didn't have dads or had bad ones? Because here's the reality, they were not coddled, they were not loved, and they wanted a different life than what they had, so they put the extra work in to get where they want to get to. And so we must learn that our role is to connect our children with Abba Father. So number one, the role of an earthly father. In Genesis 1, it it makes it plain for us. We're to be fruitful and increase. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over it. So we're, as I said last week, our job's to replicate. Everybody say replicate. We're to be responsible as fathers, an earthly father. We're not talking about Abba Father here, but we learn all these principles from Abba Father. We must take the role of a father by teaching our children to take responsibility for their actions. One of the hardest things to do as a parent is to know when to let go, when to let that child's actions bring the consequences to their life without protecting them from the consequences. I heard a story just this past week about a mother, she's in this church, I'm not gonna say her name, but about 10 years ago, her daughter was severely hooked on meth and other drugs, been in trouble a number of times, and every judge kept showing grace and grace and grace And a mother in this church went to the judge and said these words, judge, if you don't put my daughter in jail, she's gonna die. And the judge said, you mean to tell me you want me to put your daughter in jail? She said, you better believe I do. It's the only thing that's gonna keep her alive. And let me tell you, that daughter spent a year and a half there and has been sober now seven years, makes $95,000, is a good mother. All because her mother cared enough to say, judge, put her in jail. Let her suffer the consequences. And I know that preaches easier than it lives. But sometimes, friend, the best thing we can do for our children is when they fall, let them bump their head. Let them suffer the consequences of their own actions. We're to replicate. We're to teach them responsibility. We're to reward them. Absolutely. Absolutely. People say, oh, you don't want to spoil your child or you you don't want to reward them. A bribe is an enticement for evil. We don't bribe our children, but a reward is an enticement for good. You know, if my children do something I want them to do, I'll try to get a little seed money. It's amazing how far that seed will go, amen? It's amazing what a little seed will do at that age. It teaches them, hey, I get blessed for doing what's right. Hey, I don't get blessed for doing what's wrong. Because the whole entire world system we live in operates that way, if you think about it. And we're teaching them right from wrong, but we're to reward our children for good behavior and biblical behavior, and we're to teach them right from wrong. And it's not as simple as you may think. You know, they watch our behaviors, and they learn really the worst things we do first, and then when they become adults, they remember all the good we did. But as growing up, I remember, you know, my dad did all these wonderful things and I would always remember the worst things he did. You know, the three times he cussed, those were my favorite things to remember, you know, when we were little. He's cussed a lot more since then now that he's retired, but back then it wasn't all that much. But I mean, I would always remember and quote it. And one day he said, Ronnie, I've written 20 books and I've led all these people, Lord, and you just remember the three times I lost my temper, you know. But as kids, we do, we, we want to pinpoint our parents' stuff, you know. And I'm telling you though, we get to a certain age and for me it happened when I started having my own children. I realized, hey, this is quite a burden. It's a little different when God allows you to be a steward of a child. Earthly father, let's talk about honor. It says we're to honor our father and Malachi speaking as the prophet of God says, where's my honor, not for his, but God, the Lord of hosts. Why is honor so important and and what is honor? Honor is simply understanding who someone is, what position they are in, and what they've been through to get to where they are. 
and being willing to speak life into that, to speak honor and to really understand someone's position or role. It's a respect thing. And if you don't learn to honor and respect someone, then you will never have that honor either. If you have a place you want to go, if you don't honor, you'll never get to where you want to go. If you don't learn to respect those who've gone before you, you'll never get to where God's called you to go. There's nothing that irritates me more than a disrespectful young person. And I'm not talking about a teenager. I'm talking about 20, 30, 40s who doesn't respect their elders, who doesn't respect position, who doesn't refer to people in the manner they should refer to them as. We must learn to honor. Proverbs 10, one says, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. So here in Malachi, in verse two, God the father's introduced with some characteristics of what a father should do and what a father should be to his children. These are actually the characteristics of God and we learn from these characteristics what we as fathers should be and do for our children. First, it says, Malachi chapter one, verse two, before he rebukes them, before he he brings judgment on them, he says, I have loved you. Everybody say "Love." love. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say in what way have you loved us? And then he mentions Esau, Jacob's brother. He said, Jacob, I've loved and Esau, I've hated. What he's saying is, look, I have loved you. I've chosen you. We are the people of God. We are called by God. Remember, even though you're rebelling against me, I love you. Even though you're breaking my heart, I love you. Even though I'm about to bring punishment down and judgment down, I love you. Understand that's who we are as a father. We never stop loving. So a father first professes a love. Everybody say love. We learn that from God. God loves us first and foremost. That doesn't mean he always agrees with us. That doesn't mean we always make him happy or he's always going to give us our way or we're not going to have to pay for the things we do or the things we say or the mess we get ourselves in. That doesn't change God's love. It professes the love. I've loved you, says the Lord. Then it goes on in the next few verses. So we honor because someone first loved us. Honor is easy when you know that someone has loved you. Amen? And so if you want honor, you need to be a person of love. It professes a love. Number two, it provides for needs. Everybody say needs. That's who God is and that's who we are to be according to Ephesians and Colossians in the New Testament as fathers. We've got to provide for the needs of our children. In fact, it says in the New Testament that if you don't provide for your children, you're worse than an unbeliever. I mean, that is the fundamental, foundational, first principle of being a father, is provision. It's very interesting to me how the father uh, role has changed over the years. Most baby boomers, my father's a baby boomer, mother's a baby boomer, they weren't raised with a lot of hugs. If you study science and you study humanities, uh, most of our baby boomer parents or grandparents they weren't given hugs and told by their dads they were loved very often. There was a shift that came in about the night, late 70s and 80s where they were told that as parents they should tell their children they love them, that it helps their mental health, their emotional support, their growth, all of these things. And so we saw a shift. And see, I know that my grandfather did not do that to my dad much. But my dad had to train himself to be affectionate with us. Sometimes it was awkward like hugging a porcupine because his dad didn't do him that way. But he made himself do it so that we would have the balance that we needed in our lives. And I thank God I'm a big mushy hugger because of that. But I know many other men in my life who had fathers back during the Great Depression and before that, they were providers, but they weren't very physical as far as hugging and kissing and all of those kinds of things. But there was an awareness because of the provision that dad loved me. See, if you're not intimate with God, if you're not intimate with God, see, David didn't necessarily see God as a father. He just had daddy issues and he knew how to worship Adonai, the Lord, and get in the spirit enough where God put his favor on him because he knew how to get to God's heart. But David was pioneering something in the spirit 
And I'm not even sure if David knew what it was. He just knew it was intimate. He knew of the spirit that he needed in the connection with God. But really, I believe that is the first instance where we really see this father covering in connection, where we really see this void field in someone's life. We don't know what void it is really, but we know David had issues at home. God filled the void. And now we all have issues at home and we need God to fill the void. We need God the Father to fill the void. And that's what we have to understand, that we get our affirmation from Abba Father. I've taught on an orphan spirit a number of times and I don't wanna stay long on that rabbit trail today, but you have to ask yourself sometimes, why do I need approval from man? Why do I need affirmation from man? Why do I need 17 titles? Why do I need to be on the stage? Why do I have to be in front of people? Why do I have to look for acceptance and be this or be that? And we all struggle with that. There's nothing wrong with godly ambition, but if if that's out of balance and you always have to be the man or be the woman or be on stage and you you need stage, you need fame, you need followers, if you get into that, it's an orphan spirit. There's something in you that's not accepted, affirmed, and there's no access to Abba because if there's access to Abba, you don't have to get all the credit and all the attention. And it's a process of intimacy with Abba that allows you to disconnect from having to be in the limelight all the time. It's honor, it professes a love, it provides for needs, physical needs, emotional needs, and spiritual needs. It protects from harm. It protects from harm. A good father will protect their children until they can't protect them any longer. It's our job as their children to cover them, protect them, to put a hedge around them, to make sure that they get to the age of accountability. Even if it means we have to make a decision that they hate us for, for a period of time. See, if you get real rebellious as a teenager, a a child, it's a a Christian parent's job to do whatever it takes to keep your butt alive till you're an adult. And if that means send you off or whatever it may be, that may be what has to be done because we are held accountable as parents for getting you to adulthood. After that, you have accountability. So I'm almost there, I'm, I'm listening, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. It promotes for advancement. A father promotes for advancement. That's why we honor fathers. That's what a godly leader does. That's what God the Father does, it promotes for advancement. If you have a healthy connection with your mentor, whatever it may be, you're gonna see promotion in your life because of how you've honored. Everything that I've had in my life, every neat opportunity, every place I've traveled is because I genuinely always honor people who are in different positions than me. And it's not fake. It's not agenda driven. I genuinely try to be a person of honor because the heroes that I admire, the preachers I admire, I've watched live that throughout my entire life. I've watched the humble ones get elevated and the arrogant ones fall. So my goal has always been to stay low, point to God, and let him take care of my journey. And I'm gonna tell you, even if you're not in ministry, that'll work for you. Stay low, give God the glory, do your best through the Holy Spirit to serve and look at others with love. Look past at the law, look forward to the victory. And look to others around you with love and humility, helping them become better and God will take care of you. He absolutely will. Number three, spiritual fathers by ourselves. You know, whenever this concept was introduced to me in in the charismatic movement, sometimes it really bothered me for a while because I saw so many con artists use this terminology to like get somewhere. I'm sure you business people understand there are people who will use you to get somewhere, right? And I would see people call my dad spiritual father and then they'd change when they met somebody more famous that could get them to another place. There's a few in town, but I won't mention their name. But I I saw that and, and it began to put a sour taste in my mouth. 
And I said, listen, I don't want my kids having any spiritual fathers. I'm their daddy. I think that's creepy. It is. I, I got, I, that's my role. Call you, my kids, come on, my, this is my spiritual father. What? That's my role. Now then, so it rubbed, rubbed me for a long time, but then I started thinking of Elijah and Elisha and Paul and Timothy and Ruth and Naomi, and I started thinking of all these relationships, and there is a godly mentorship, and there can be a spiritual mother, and there can be a spiritual father because 60% of our children are being raised without a father, so we've got to allow the Bible to work something out for these children that have no father, so there comes the role of a spiritual father. What Joe Smith's been doing for a long time, what many of you do in helping other people. We need spiritual fathers, we need spiritual mothers. Those of us that understand these principles, it's our job to reach beyond ourselves and help somebody else that maybe doesn't have that. You say, I don't have the energy to chase around little kids. Well, write a check, Joe will take it. I'll take it too. We'll get it to the youth associations, the people doing the work, promise you that. We've got to do a better job, Christians, in mentoring other people. So I'm buying, I believe in spiritual fathers and mothers. What I don't believe in is critics and cons who use that lingo to get promoted and to get things for themselves when they don't mean it. One of the greatest acts of honor I've seen in the last few months our friend Damon Thompson, I don't even know if my father knows this, but when he was here and I interviewed him at my conference a few years ago and we sat on stools, it's on YouTube. A lot of people have, have viewed this Q and A, but I knew his backstory. The world really didn't until I interviewed him, but Damon's apostle and spiritual father was his youth pastor named Aaron. The guy has never preached to the amount of people Damon has. He's not famous at all. But Damon has remained loyal and submitted to him as a father. And the neatest thing happened just a few months ago. Aaron had built a church and started it with his entire family for 32 years. And I got to watch live as he gave every bit of it to Damon and Tammy. It was powerful. Gave his entire ministry. And Damon's been a son to him all those years. That was just his youth pastor that bought him a frozen drink and let him sleep on his couch. It's just powerful with the way God works. Other than my father, my mentor's Bobby. I have famous people in my life. Bishop Del Bronner is who I consider my bishop. And he's agreed to be my bishop. And we've went through that process and I, I admire him, he's my hero. But my mentor's Bobby Atkins. And he's preaching, well, he's on vacation this week. But normally he's preaching to way less people than I am. But when I need some accountability, I go to him. And I even go to dad and he'll say, you need to call Bobby. <laughs> it's the truth. So I'm buying, I believe in it. And I believe you need somebody in your life that you're not using that can really look at you and say, you're wrong. You're about to screw up, don't blow it. Don't do this. You have an orphan spirit you need delivered. Stop looking at things through this lens. Let me show you a different way. Let me correct you. If you can't be t taught or corrected, then God can't bless you and mature you. You got to have somebody in your life that can show you the weak places. That can show you the cracks. That won't expose you for your sins or your weaknesses. That'll help clean you up point you back to God's word, remind you of the victory that's coming and teach you to look at people through the lens of love. So I'm buying. I believe in mantles. I believe that God will bless you and he will touch you and you can become what God's called you to become if you'll stay submitted in a place of humility and service. Why? And I close here because he's a good father. So after all this silence, John the Baptist comes about baptizing in the wilderness. Then Jesus comes and does what he does, dying for the sins of humanity, connecting us with a loving father that loves us where it's not all judgment and law and fire and damnation where a God, because of the sacrifice of his son, can really love a human being that's sinful, dirty, and falls short. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that grace. 
that Jesus died for today. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. He is my daddy, God. He's my daddy, God. He's where I go when I'm weak. He's where I go when I'm sad. He's where I go when I'm dirty and I've blown it and I brought shame onto my life. I go to my Abba Father and he cleans me up, puts a new song in my spirit, word in my mouth, picks me back up, puts me back in the field, puts me back in the fight, puts me back in the race. He's a good father. And I challenge you to know God the way I know him through Jesus. Know that he's a loving father. Know that he created you for a purpose. Know that he loves to give good and perfect gifts to his children. Say this. This is going to mess with some of you so bad. Say, God wants to bless me. Oh, that was hard for some of you religious people. I could just feel it. He does. He's not mad at you all the time. God wants to bless you. God wants to do creative and wondrous works in your life. Just get out of your own way and let Abba be Abba. Oh, what manner has God the Father loved us? First John, that we should be called what? Children of God. And next week, we're going to get into how to be filled with the Holy Ghost because I'm bringing a Holy Ghost Pentecostal preacher in here from West Virginia it's going to talk to you a little more about this and by we're going to have some people filled with the Holy Ghost next week but I'm telling you today I want you to get your affirmation from the right place your acceptance from the right place and get your heart in tune with Abba I believe you can do it but if you're lost it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ so let's get that done Let's go ahead and accept the free gift that Jesus has offered us. Connection and access to the Father. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you need Jesus in your life, if you have sin in your life, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit that causes your heart to cry out, Abba, Father. If there's something in you lost, missing, broken, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you need Jesus in your life, you need forgiveness, just pray this prayer with me. In your heart or out loud. Abba's house, help me. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. If you prayed that prayer in a minute, I want you to come down. Our pastors are going to make our way down right now. And if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says, listen, another reference to the Father. It says this, if you will not confess me in front of, the, of your friends, I will not confess you in front of my Father. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, if this isn't good enough for everybody else, it ain't going to be good enough for my daddy. So if you prayed that prayer and you say, I'm settling it, I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. I'm coming into connection and covenant. You come down just a minute, man. We got a lot of pastors. You come down just a minute. You make your way down if that's you. Maybe you want to join this church. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of the Father's house, a grace place. You want to bring your family in covenant with us. You can t you, they'll tell you how to do that. Maybe you need healing. Maybe your father walked away or your father passed away and you're just hurting this morning. Trust me, these men and women of God know how to pray you through that. It's just 11.49. If you need ministry this Father's Day, don't leave without letting us minister to you. We want to do that. Don't miss your opportunity. Would you stand on your feet today? Be cognizant of the people to your right and left. You may need to walk someone down that's hurting today. Listen, we're not spectators. We're a family. So be aware of what's going on around you. And if you need ministry, you come. Heavenly Father, you move this Father's Day. I already feel your presence. Heal the sick. Heal the brokenhearted. Deliver the captives. Do your thing. Abba. In Jesus' name. Amen. You come as we worship.